have just tuned in. We're in our last class for our last journey class for this for this year, actually. Yeah, for this whole for for this year, and we're about to go into Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is a big deal for all of us. We got a lot of stuff planned, a lot of stuff to do. Yeah, yeah. You don't have a lot, Miss G. Oh yes. Oh, you do. Okay, I was gonna say yes. Yes, we got the big country Cajun cook-off coming up on the first first Sunday night of December. Like next Sunday night. We'll be, we won't have anything going, but then the next Sunday night, we'll be up at the, the campground about this time. So, yeah, and then everything else starts for December and all that kind of stuff. So this will be, this will be a little bit different this year for us uh, in, in, on Sunday morning. You know, usually we have our uh, Freedom River Christmas at some point close to Christmas where we just basically take the whole service and we do music and we do people that do like some of our children sing and people that play an instrument uh, or anybody that wants to share anything. Bell sings, uh, what, what do you usually sing? Silent Night? No, wait, what is it? I don't know, they give me something different. They give you something every year. <laughs> you and Lawrence, I forgot. I don't want to insult you, Lawrence. I, I remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah. That, my wife. My wife. I don't. That, my wife. Y'all, I don't know what about. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Y'all are here all about this. Um, no, she was just signaling me, you know, move on, dog, move on, because I'm, I'm trying to do ten of them tonight instead of just five. Because, uh, you know, Thanksgiving weekend, next Sunday night's not really a good time to try to do, you, do stuff like this. Because you guys, some of you are out of pocket, some of you have family, some of you have other stuff going on. And then, of course, then Christmas starts, all the stuff for Christmas, so you're just kind of out there. So I didn't want to just leave, like, do five tonight and then leave five hanging for whenever it might be that we could get back together. Because these laws of ministry here are, uh, are really... Uh, if you really wanted just to boil them down to a single thought, it would be, this is why God gave us partners. This is why God gave us a mate for, the, for these 10 reasons right here. And, and what th this particular um, journey class talks about and these laws, these 10 laws of ministry, I call them 10 laws of ministry um, because all of us have a ministry. And even though you may not stand in a pulpit and preach a message or sing or teach class or something like that that you would consider to be, quote, ministry, our whole lives are ministry. I mean, everything we do is ministry. God's given us people to minister, uh, children, grandchildren, uh, family, neighbors, friends, acquaintances, people we run into just by happenstance, so to speak. All of those people that pass through our lives uh, are opportunities for us to reflect Christ and, and to reflect the fact that uh, there's something unique about the Lord or something about our life that uh, is captivating to them. And I know this is kind of a scary thought to think, but, you know, somebody, somebody admires you. Somebody wants to be like you. Somebody thinks you're the greatest. And, and, and you might not even be aware of it. But they're watching you, and they see what you do, and they see how you are. And they admire and respect that. And so those are the people that you have a tremendous amount of influence over. Because the things that you typically do that you really probably don't think anything about, to them, they're making mental notes about that. And they're watching, and they're seeing, and, and they, 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 want to, they want that to be true about them. Mm -hmm. And... So you can, you know, as a, as a person, you have a ministry is what I'm saying to you. And uh, with some tremendous responsibilities. I, I was joking around before we started talking about family traditions. And it's really great for families to have traditions. It's, it actually is a tremendous thing. I, I think it's very important for families to have traditions. So we try to, you know, have our traditions and... Uh, and, and it's a little bit difficult at times when you're in the ministry because usually when you're in the ministry, I mean, in like church ministry, um, 
you, you move some, you know, and um, I mean, you're not like me and just come here and <laughs> settle down for the rest of your life, you know, you, you actually are, are called to somewhere and, and you may be called to somewhere else um, in, in a, a year from now or something like that. And so when you do, you usually leave behind some people in your life that most likely were part of a tradition of some kind or another, you know. Belvin Lawrence said, if you ever leave here, you just, you just got to make sure wherever you go and we can come too, you know. And uh, I said, yeah, that's right. I said, so I got to be careful where I go because I want to make sure. But I'm going to tell you, unless, unless the Lord just really, I don't know, I, I don't even want to say anything because I know I don't want to challenge him to anything. It's almost like the Lord's listening, yes, yes. He's saying yes, yes, what are you going to say? Uh, <laughs> because it's almost like waving a red flag in front of a bull, you know. It's like, oh, so I'm Lord of your life over everything but that. Okay, let's just see about that, you know. <laughs> We're going to send you to Bangladesh. That's where you're going, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not saying I'll go anywhere he wants. You know that, Lord. I'm, I'm not saying a thing about what I will or won't do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Say, it didn't say Freedom River. Right, it right. Said, <laughs> to you, yeah. So remember now. I got you, and I caravan. believe me, you know, and I hold that I, I, really, and and I'm not just trying to. I mean, you guys, you know, I love you, and and y'all are very. Y'all are involved in everything, and y'all are great, and, and I don't know what we'd do. I don't know how we'd have a church without you. But, uh, but you know, I do think about that. I do think about all of you guys when, when opportunities present themselves and you're around people that, you know, maybe have been part of your life before, and they say, man, when are you coming back? Or when, just different things. And I know they're, they're being nice, you know. I know that, that, that that's something that would say we miss you and you were – a good part of our life, but still, uh, doors are open for things like that. But mm -hmm. I, but I, I always think I say, now how am I going to get Freedom River up to where you know how would I how would that happen? How would we get there? But I don't think anything like that. I I think the Lord's got me where He wants me, and uh, and uh, we were just talking. Matter of fact, Tanya and I on the way in that there's uh, one of our members said there's a little church building for sale, and. Um, out kind of in our neck of the woods, and I thought, well, and it's funny, I got interested in that because I don't know why, but but anyway, I just kind of thought, well, that, that's interesting, and uh, so anyway, we'll see what's going on, see what the Lord leads us in, and all of that, but it wouldn't be any, it wouldn't be going anywhere different, it'd just be another little location here, but uh, anyway, y'all don't get talking about that and anybody on the internet i'm the one jabbering about it i'm like a, i'm like a I'm like a magpie man i just get going <laughs> no y'all y'all are just sitting there you know what y'all are encouraging me y'all are encouraging me you know you're encouraging me you know how you encourage me by, by looking <laughs> you're looking and that's encouraging me you know? <laughs> Yeah, you don't even have to say amen. Just look, you know. But anyway, what was I off on? Oh, I was off on, I was off on the fact that the reason the Lord gives you a mate is because you have a ministry and there's power in, um, in 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 the union and in the unity of of a mate, and it's much more powerful than you think. It's much deeper than you think just having like one more person you're thinking okay well it's just me by myself and you can be by yourself and minister and the you know scripture talks about in corinthians about the fact paul actually says in first corinthians 7 he says you're better off if you're not married because you don't have to worry about a mate and planning what to do in case the lord called you to do this or go there or you know, and you're all your time that you have, you, you're all your time is your own, and you don't have to worry about going home and trying to make supper or take care of a family or, you know, uh, do something with, you, with, you, with your husband or your wife. You're completely free, you know, if you're single. And so you're able to serve the Lord with no restrictions whatsoever. But if you're married, obviously you have to consider your family and, and, and you have a... a a unique situation there with your children, your family, and so forth, and all the stuff it takes to make that function and operate. 
So you certainly can serve the Lord by yourself. There's no, I mean, you don't have to have a mate to serve the Lord. But since you do, and the Lord has called you to someone, the Lord has given you someone, and, you know, you may want to trade them in now, I don't know, but but it's too late. <laughs> and so you stuck with what you got. And, uh, and, and the Lord wants you to uh, prosper and, and, and to thrive from this, for this to be a good thing for you. And so there, there are 10 things that uh, I think are really important that the Bible says about the relationship that we have with one another that, that identifies why you have a mate. I mean, if, if, if you were complete in yourself, then he wouldn't give you a mate, you know? I mean, if you had all of the emotional characteristics and all of the physical qualities and all the everything you needed, if you were just completely f perfect by yourself, you wouldn't need a mate. But because most of us are not, you know, he says, let me bring someone alongside you that you guys can, can be a team and, and I can create in you uh, make you better than you ever would have been by yourself and make them better than they ever would have been by themselves. And we can, and, and together, you two can be used in great ways. And so what are, what are those laws? So let's just get into them because, like I said, I, got, I have 10 of them to get in the next, uh, what is it, uh, 45 minutes roughly or so. All right, here we go. Number one, the law of agreement. The law of agreement. Uh, we do this every Sunday morning with our church. One of, the, one of the great things about being in a church is that uh, you're part of a family. You're part of a group of people who have chosen to be together, who have uh, in some way been drawn together by what I believe is the Spirit of God, what I pray is the Spirit of God. I, I really believe that about our church, by the way. I really do. Um, I, I know we're a small church, and I know that there are, are lots of churches that are really just big and gigantic and stupendous and everything else. And they have their benefits because of that. There's some benefits to size and numbers and so forth. But I just, you know, for me, and I guess, and I mean, maybe it may be this time of my life, you know, it may be the time of where my spiritual life is and, and what God's called me to do and what I sense the responsibility of and so forth. Uh, that our church is, just seems to be perfectly suited for me, <laughs> me um, because it feels like a family. It does. I, I don't have any, I mean, seriously, and this is very unusual to say, and I know if, if I have any pastor friends that are watching or any of you guys that have been in church on committees and other things or deacons and all that kind of stuff for a long time, you'll, you'll, you could shake your head <laughs> with what I'm saying. Don't let anybody see you, but, you know, you, you could. And, um, but... It, you know, I have never, and I've been in eight churches in my lifetime. I've served the Lord for 43 years in the ministry. I started when I was 18, so that's, yeah, 30, 44 years. So I started when I was 18, and I can honestly say that in all of the areas of ministry that I've been in, I've never had a whole group of people that, that being around any of them, I mean, I'm talking about any of the people here. I have no sense of dread whatsoever about being in their presence. And that's very unusual to be able to say about a group of people that's, you know, 50, 75, 80, whatever, 100 people. You know, there's, there always seems to be some in, in, the, in the group that really wants to try to control the group and instruct the group and correct people in the group. And like when, if you're a pastor and you come into that group, they're gonna do subtle things. They're gonna do innuendos. Mm -hmm. They're gonna do, they're gonna make statements that are intended to convey something that they feel needs to be done, ought to be done, should be done. Mm -hmm. And it mostly involves you, mm -hmm. you know, it mostly like, even though it might not be about you, it implies that you are need to do something or you, whatever. And, and then, you, you know, you have to deal with that emotionally and decide whether you're going to pop them or not, you know, or, or what you're going to do to them. And uh, are you going to blast them? Or are you going to embarrass them or belittle them or, 
or you're just going to let it ride or, you know, whatever. You, but you, but you, you're in a strain. You're, it, it's, it's tense, you know. And when you go into that presence, you, sent, you feel tense, you know. You're not, you're not relaxed and, you know, and, and don't sense any of that. But I, here, I'm serious. I don't have one person that I have any sense at all of anything like that. And that's just a wonderful, t I mean, that's a blessing from the Lord. Yes, I mean, that is, that's just really, that's really just such a blessed life, <laughs> and, you know? And, uh, and so I thank the Lord for it. And, and so every Sunday morning we get to come together and one of the first things we do is we ask people to come down to the altar if they need to be prayed for. And so we start our service with an invitation, you know. Usually you have one at the end, but we start with one and, and have one at the end too, but, you know. But anyway, but we ask them to come down, and if you need to be prayed for, let's just lay these things before the Lord before we ever even start. And then I say to the congregation every Sunday, I say, now our job is to pray the prayer of agreement. And then I give a little tiny explanation about that, you know, that we all need each other and, the Bible, uh, New Testament, 51 times in the New Testament, the phrase one another is used, which, in, which says we, and it says pray for one another, encourage one another, lift one another, share one another's burdens, uh, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice. I mean, it's just filled with the admonition that we need each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we need each other for is to pray with a sense of agreement that something would be would be so, and of course, for us as Christians, um, we're praying that what that God's purpose for whatever's going on in somebody's life would be accomplished. In other words, we're we're saying, God, we agree with you. Uh, we we want this to to be so. May it be so in their life. And we're saying, Amen. We're saying, Yes, do it, Lord. And I know that seems simplistic very and it seems like well that couldn't really matter you know much. but if you look in the scripture you see numbers of illustrations of husbands and wives who either agree to the good or agree to the bad and you see things intensified because of that i mean you you have some notable ones uh Jezebel and Ahab I mean, when I say the, the name Jezebel, you automatically think that wicked witch. Well, that's right. She was a wicked witch. She was married to Ahab, who was the king of Israel. And Ahab was a, was a Jew. And Jezebel was his wife. He chose her, and she's, you know, uh, outside of the faith and everything. She was a Baal worshiper, and she brought Baal into the kingdom and tried to make people worship Baal. and do. I mean, she was a horrible, wicked a uh, terrible individual. That's why nobody's named Jezebel. Do, do y'all know anybody named Jezebel now? People name their dogs Jezebel, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but they don't name their children Jezebel. Usually there might be one or two. But anyway, uh, don't want to insult you if you're Jezebel and you're watching. I'm sure that you are a wonderful person, and I apologize for saying that. But, uh, but the point is, when I say that name, you automatically, you just go, wicked, evil, you know, bad person. Well, uh, what made her worse was the fact that her husband agreed with her. When she would come, she would bring these things to Ahab, then he would decree them into the, you know, into the kingdom. So, and he was in agreement with her, and they were in agreement. And terrible things happened, and bad things happened, and horrible conditions for the people of God. And, and ultimately, Jezebel was thrown off the top of a wall and splattered on the on the pavement and the dogs licked her blood, you know. Uh, there's a famous uh, sermon, uh, Dr. R.G. Lee, I know most of you don't know his name, but if, if you were a preacher and you hung around the right services, uh, Dr. R.G. Lee for many, many, many decades, kind of like a white E.V. Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the old Puritan days, man, I mean, in, in the 50s and 40s, you know, in the old Puritan days, the 50s and 40s and 30s, had a famous sermon called Payday Someday, and it was about Jezebel and about, you know, there's a payday coming. And so anyway, but the point is that she actually made Ahab far worse than he ever would have been by himself. He would have never done all of that by himself. But, and, and then he empowered her to do worse than she ever would have done by herself. And so 
you know, you have the, the, the principle of agreement there in a negative kind of way. Adam and Eve, another example of the power of agreement in a negative way. Uh, I know most people don't know this, and I know I've, I've taught you this before, so I, I know you remember every detail of it, and I don't need to do it again, but somebody watching may not have ever heard this before. Um, but, but Adam and Eve, uh, Adam was sitting right there with Eve when Satan came to seduce her. I mean, read it in the book. <laughs> read the scripture. It's in there. I mean, Adam is, Adam is sitting right there in the presence of the, the serpent as he speaks to Eve about what God told them. And Adam sits there and watches Satan seduce his wife in his presence and does nothing about it. Adam doesn't say, wait a minute, wait a minute, get away. You don't have any authority around here. That's not what God said. Mm -hmm. God said we could eat of any tree uh, in the garden except that one, you know. Uh, and he didn't say we couldn't eat of any of the trees. And, you know, and, and all the deception. In, in, in other words, uh, the fall of mankind was, a, was an agreement between a husband and wife. And the, and, and the salvation of mankind was an agreement between a husband and wife. Now, I'm just talking about human beings, not, not Christ on the cross. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about Noah and his wife who built the ark, right? You remember this. You know there wouldn't have been any humans on the earth for Jesus to save if Noah hadn't obeyed God and built an ark because everybody on the face of the earth except Noah and his wife and their sons and their wives were the only people on the ark. And so when they got off the ark, there were no people on the earth. There, was only, there were only dead things everywhere. And so there would be no people on the earth had it not been for the agreement of a husband and wife that they would obey God and that Noah would indeed spend 100 years, 120 years building an ark. For what? You know, they weren't even near a body of water. There had never been any rain on the earth. What in the world would we be building this giant boat for here, you know? Well, there you go. Perfect agreement. Aquila and Priscilla that taught uh, the Apostle Paul when he was Saul and got knocked off the back of the donkey in a Tekean rainstorm, you know? And Jesus said, uh, uh, why do you curse all Saul? Why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus who you persecute. And, he was, and, and, the, and Saul, the Pharisee, became Paul, the apostle of God, on, laying on his back in the middle of a rainstorm on a little road to a place called Tekia. Mm -hmm. And God sent him to a husband and wife to train him and teach him, Aquila and Priscilla. And he went in their house, and they and they and they nurtured him. And they he was blind from the from the vision of God. I mean, he couldn't see. And they took care of him, and they trained him, and they taught him the word, and taught him about Christ. And then and then one, and then he started preaching. And later on, you know, he was preaching. He's full of zeal, but not full of a lot of knowledge. And and they were the ones that took him aside and said, "Hey, come come come, on, let's talk to you a minute." You're getting a few things just kind of out of whack here, just a little bit. So here, if you do this, it'll be a little better. And you know, I mean, that was Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. I'm just saying the Bible's filled with this kind of stuff. Elijah and Elisha. There you go, another couple. Not not husband and wife, but certainly prophet and mentor. E, you know, and and Elijah taught Elisha everything about God and. Even looked at Elijah and said, "Man, Elisha said, now, we'll have to talk to him when we get to heaven about these names.' But because they're so close, it's hard to keep them apart." But Elijah was the old man prophet, and Elisha was his young student, and and Elijah went with him everywhere. And then and then uh, Elisha said, "When when you go to be with the Lord, I want a double portion of everything you have to fall on me." And Elijah looked at him and said, "Well, if you're there and you see me go up, you'll get it." In other words, if you won't quit on me. If you won't walk away, if you'll hang with me to the end, I believe God will give you a double portion of what he's given me. And as the chariot took Elijah to heaven, chariot of fire took Elijah to heaven, Elisha's sitting there and catches his mantle as, it, as his mantle falls off of him, you know, his cloak and all that. It was called his mantle, and it fell, and, and, and Elisha got it, and Elisha looked at it, and now the big question was, is this thing going to do the same thing for me that it did for him? 
And he said, well, let's just see. And he touched the Jordan, and the Jordan parted just like it did for Elijah. And buddy Elisha, the prophet, is on the roll. And Elisha did great things. It was Elisha that raised the widow's son, you know, and laid on him and, and the widow that built the house for him, built the little room. I'm not the widow, but the woman who built the room for him and her husband built the little room for the prophet. And they had a child even though she was old and he was old. And then the child died one day and Elijah, Elisha came in there and, and put his face on his face and laid his body on his body. And the little fella coughed seven times and then came back to life again. I mean... Gosh, you know, I mean, I'm just saying that there, there's the power of agreement. Mm -hmm. and, and when we, you know, Pastor Tanya and I, many times, we do it quite often. Uh, there are things that happen in our family uh, that are just tremendously tough, uh, especially at the time. I mean, they're just family stuff like happens in your families, but... Uh, man, we just need an answer from the Lord. We need the Lord to work in this or something. We need the Lord to change somebody's heart, you know, fix this, do something, God, you know. And, and it's almost like, gosh, man, how could that ever be, you know, fixed? Because that's just, you know, how things happen in your family. Sometimes you think, gosh, man, this is terrible. This will never be, you know. And you're looking at your family and they're kind of never being the same again. And it's some kind of breach and it's some kind of really devastating something. And it's some kind of big drama going on. And, and you want to turn it over to the Lord. And you've prayed about it yourself, but it just seems like it just stuff still is not working right. And so I said, come on, Tanya, let's come, come here, let's pray. And we'll get there and we'll pray. We'll just say, Lord, we're, we're standing here in agreement with each other. And we're saying amen to your purpose, and we want your purpose to be accomplished. Yeah, yeah. And we both speak the same thing. Mm -hmm. Tanya says, yes, we speak the same thing. We're in agreement that your purpose would be accomplished. And, Lord, however you're going to do this, whatever we need to do, you, te you show us. You give us wisdom about this. But, Lord, this is, this, we're your family. This is your kingdom, and this is your will, and we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And I guarantee you, we've seen things turn around in 30 minutes. It's unbelievable, and it was like, good night, that's a miracle. Well, it's the power of agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying we can stand there and pray, you know, I, Lord, we want a pink Cadillac. God, we got to have one, you know. I mean, I'm not saying it's a magic good luck charm. I'm just saying that the power of agreement is far more powerful than you may think it is. And if you read the scripture, you see it all the time, both to the good and to the bad. So one of the reasons God gave you a mate is so that you can have someone to agree with you. And that's one reason why it is extremely vital that you do not yoke yourself to someone who is not a believer. This is one reason, one definite reason why you are not to be unequally yoked. The Bible tells you don't do this. It says don't. Don't hook yourself up with somebody who's not a believer. If you're a believer, if you're a believer, don't hook up with somebody who's not a believer. Mm -hmm. And don't just take their word for it either. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I teach our grandchildren, I'm, I'm not sure how successful I'm going to be at this. But it won't be because I'm not trying. I'm just going to tell you that. I told them, I said, look, you bring your, if you think you're interested in somebody, and they're, I mean, my young, my, 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 grandchildren are getting one's a senior in high school one's a junior in high school i got some ninth graders uh seventh graders uh and eighth grade and then jacks who's you know dragging the rear but i mean he'll be hopefully he'll be a long time coming but 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 i got them and uh and i teach them and i'm telling them and i'm serious about it and if they i know they'll come over to the house and they come over the house with some drag up with something that I ain't interested in, I'll, you can bet money I'll be letting them know about it too. And, and, uh, but they're just getting to the point where they're kind of starting to have some serious, you know, when I say serious, I mean something other than like little kid stuff. And I say, look, you bring them over and, and introduce them, let me talk to them. I mean, you know, get, be around them some. If I give a thumbs up, fine. If I give a thumbs down, goodbye. You are not what we're looking for. Because, I mean, you just can't let stuff happen because you can't get racehorses out of mules. Uh, you know, you got to mate them up. You know, you got you, you to pay attention to what's going on in their lives because, I mean, the devil will give them some old reprobate that's going nowhere. I mean, they're, they're not going anywhere in life, and they're going to drag this one down is what's going to happen. 
and try to mooch and live off of them the rest of their life. No, man, you've got, you got to pay attention to this. And the Scripture says, don't you let that happen. Don't get unequally yoked. I, I tell you what, I teach them. I teach them, that here's the first two questions you ask somebody. If you think you're interested in them, if they ask you, say, hey, would you like to go out to the movie Friday night or whatever, and you think, oh, he's so cute or she, whatever it might be, first question you ask is, where do you go to church? Mm -hmm. And if they stutter, goodbye. Mm -hmm. If they don't know where they go to church, mm -mm. they don't know what their pastor's name is, mm -mm. Mm -mm. that's a sure sign. They lied. They don't go to church. Mm -hmm. They may go on Christmas and Easter. That'd be about it, maybe. Mm -hmm or whenever the mama makes them go. But no, they're not, no. First question, where do you go to church? Second question, where do you work? Mm -hmm. If they stutter on either one of those, boom, bye, mm -hmm. see you. I don't care, you're a senior in high school, you ought to be working somewhere. Mm -hmm. If you're an industrious person that's going somewhere in life, by the time you get to be a junior or senior in high school, you're working somewhere. I mean, it might be very, very part-time, it might be, you know, after school a few hours or something, but you're working somewhere. Because, I mean, industrious people just don't sit around and do nothing. That's, it's people that are going somewhere don't do nothing. They, even as a 10th grader, 11th grader, 12th grader, buddy, you, you on the move. You, 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 you thinking about the future. You're going forward. You're, you have some ambition in life. You have some, you're not lazy and sit around and watch TV when you get home from school. You, you, out get, you get a job, man. You got things you need to do. Your parents are teaching you. If you want it, get you a job and pay for it. Learn how to live in this life. I guarantee you they won't be living in your basement when they're 40 years old if you'll teach them that kind of stuff. Make them get up, get out, man. This is, this, you know, you've got a life to live. This is your responsibility. I'll help you. I, you know, we'll do everything we can to get you through school and, and you know, help you if we can. But, buddy, this is your life. You've got to live it. So, you know, don't get unequally yoked together. And then if you think you, you really do like them and they're coming to church with you and they really like it, break up with them and see if they keep coming to church. If they don't keep coming to church, they're coming for the wrong reason. Make them, make them stay broke up about six months and see what happens. See if they move on to somebody else. See if they start going somewhere else. Quit coming to church or whatever. If they do, they're sign they're just faking, man. And that's, not, that's not the real deal. I'm talking about you don't want to be with somebody who doesn't have the same purpose you do and the same direction you do. That's what's happening to us nowadays. Do you know that the statistics of people who get a divorce that are in church are just as high, if not higher, than the people out there in the blooming world who don't even have any relationship to God whatsoever? Why is that? It's because we're neglecting to obey God in the beginning. We're not taking what God says seriously. We're acting like, okay, well, that's a good idea. Uh, no, that's a command. That means God says, you do this. This is serious. And you won't find yourself when you're 45 or 50 years old with a couple of kids and, and somebody walking out because they found somebody younger and more attractive. Because they're not committed to you. They're, they're all about themselves. See, this is, this is I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'll never get through. But now, but um, this is what we're talking about. God gives you a mate because you need the power of agreement in your life. Second law, the law of purpose. Uh, purpose means assignment. So God has given you an assignment. All right, we know what God's purpose is overall, right? We know, I mean, I've taught you out of the book of James, and the last uh, six weeks, I've said it every week, I've said it, I know. <laughs> we ought to have it by now. Uh, what is God's purpose for us? God's purpose for us is that we would look like Jesus. We would act like Jesus. We would shine like Jesus. People would see us and think Jesus. That's our purpose. Overall, our big overall purpose. All right? But specifically, you know, we all are different, and we have different assignments. Let's just say it that way. That's a good way to think about it. We have different assignments. What's your assignment? Well, what is it that you naturally have interest in? What is it that you're naturally concerned about? That's a good, better way of thinking. When, when you, uh, as an example, when you come to church and all the events start happening that happen at church, you know, we have people that come in the doors. We have people that are new. We have people that are first-time visitors. We have people that have been here a long time. 
We have the praise team. We have the music. We have the prayer. We have um, a word from the Lord, from the message. We have a, a media room full of technology of all kinds. All right. What just kind of naturally interests you? When you walk in those doors, what do you begin to notice? What, what, what hits you as a concern? Uh, yeah, I mean, like when you see, uh, you come in like Billy just said, he said people. I guarantee you when Billy walks in that door or stands out in that cafe and he sees somebody come in, and he can tell by their countenance or by uh, the fact that nobody's hanging with them or whatever that they may seem a little out of place or they may feel a little uncomfortable because they don't really know people or they don't know, you know, the first time they've been here or maybe they just kind of a little fish out of water kind of a feel. I guarantee you he goes, he goes to them. He's drawn to them. Mm -hmm. He notices them. He sees them. And he goes to them and tries to ease them into everything that's going on so they'll feel comfortable so they'll they won't feel out of place so that they won't be anxious and nervous about this and 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 have somebody here that's friendly to them and and acts like they want them here you know that they don't just go into a church and nobody even says anything to them nobody sees them and they walk away going man i don't even know nobody said even said i don't guess they really want me to come because nobody even said hello Believe it or not, there are churches everywhere that that happens to people all the time. They go into this church. How in the world can you, how in the world can you have a church full of people and somebody walk in that's never been there before and nobody, nobody in the church says, hey, it's good to have you today. Are you new? Is this your first time? Nobody says that or nobody shakes their hand and says, man, we're glad you're at church today or anything. Boo, kiss my foot, whatever. Uh, you know, they can walk in and out and nobody even noticed that they were there. I, what I'm saying is, Billy has an assignment. That's His life is about, that's what his assignment is. His assignment is uh, evangelistic or, or um, uh, uh, caring or, or uh, sympathy, compassion. Uh, I mean, you could name it a lot of different things, but what the, my point is that that is an assignment that God has given him as a Christian to pay attention to this. And I guarantee you, everywhere he goes, he pays attention like that, whether it's in a store or wherever it might be, his church, wherever it might be. All right, what I'm saying to you is that God gives you a mate that has that same assignment. In other words, God doesn't give us a mate who is not interested at all in whatever interests you. God gives you a similar assignments so that as a team you work together. I mean, you look at Pastor Tanya and I. God put us together. And we have the same assignment. Boy, I can't imagine what my life would be like if I was married to somebody who didn't have the same assignment I had. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine me being married to somebody that didn't even really want to come to church? That really didn't care anything about the people? who just had no interest in the things of God, could care less about anything to do with the word or people or life change. Could you imagine what, what would my life, that would be a curse. That wouldn't be a blessing, that would be a curse. Yeah, Bill, what you got? The Bible covers that to me in one scripture where it says, better to live in the bowels of hell than in yeah. But that can cover one. Yeah, right. And that is exactly right. It, it's not a comfortable thing, and it's not a good thing to, 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 not be, to not be in agreement and be together like the Lord has given us the same assignment, and God has called us to, for the same purpose and given us the same directions. And I can't imagine uh, life with, without that. And I'm just saying to you that your mate is the same. So... The laws of ministry would be, all right, God has put us together so that we can agree with each other, so that we'll have someone that we can have spiritual agreement with. We want the same things. We're praying for the same things. We're believing God for the same things. This is a, this is a powerful ally that God has given us. So when you look at your mate, look at the fact that this is a person that God has called alongside you 
to give you the ability to have this, this, this agreement. Number two, uh, God's called us to the same purpose. So now we're a team. I mean, look at Bev and Lawrence uh, as a team. Now, I'm going to tell you, as far as, the, as Lawrence and Bev go in their natures or personalities, where they've come from in life, where they've been in their lives, now, I, I didn't know them back when they were like this, but I've known them the last, what, 14 years? And, and what I've seen the last 14 years... Now, and then when, they, and at first they were, you know, they were a little rough and, and a little, you know, because they had, they had come out of an environment where they were just coming together as a husband and wife, really. I mean, y'all been together, what, uh, 15, 16 years, something like that. So they were, you know, I mean, they were just coming into each other, but, and so they were a little rough and, you know, and, and, and all of that. But look what's happened. I mean, can, can you guys, you guys, could you imagine Belle without Lawrence or Lawrence without Belle? I mean, could you, could you, could you imagine uh, that they wouldn't be working in the same direction? I mean, could you imagine that Belle would be interested in Lord and Lawrence could care less or vice versa? I mean, what do they do every Sunday? They sit out there on that bench right out in front of the church. It's freezing cold out there. It's raining out there. I mean, you know, it's covered, but that's like a little wind tunnel out there in front of the church. And they greet people, and they try to make people feel comfortable, and when they come in and they say something to them, and they're out there, they have a friendly hospitality look about them. Uh, they're relaxed, they're casual. Uh, they help people f know what to expect when they get in because they, if they see them and they say, hey, well, you know, these people aren't that bad. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and I'm just saying that there's an, a, there's an example of two people from two totally different backgrounds, totally different backgrounds, totally operate different in life, had different experiences in life, came from different directions in life, and yet here they are called together, and then God has spent the last 15, 16 years making them into one with the same purpose. Gosh, man, I mean, even had to bring them from Chicago down here to, to do it, you know? I mean, it's just, I'm just saying that this is one of the things the Scripture shows us is a very powerful aspect of having a mate and being in ministry together. And whether you think you're in ministry or not, if you belong to Christ, you are in ministry and you are either working for him or running people away from him, one or the other. Believe me. So our job is to draw them in, draw them in, draw them in. And let the other gifts operate for them. I mean, God's put us together as a whole big body. We have different... We are, Romans says God's put us in a body and given us a, and given us a gift that, that, that we do well. So whatever that is, do it. And I'll do what I do, and you do what you do, and Miss Jackie does what she does, and Bree does what she does, and Billy does, and Pat does, you know, and Mitch does, and Sharon does, and Bev, and Lawrence. And, and, and when we all do what we do well, we, we're not reaching out trying to do something we're not equipped for or that we don't have any concern about. We're doing what we do well, and we're being us, you know, and, and just being responsive and paying attention and listening to the Lord, and, and we don't come in here you know, slack and lazadaisical and, 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 and all bent out of shape over some little something that's happened with us. I mean, we're on guard, man. We're, we're, we're watching. We're paying attention to what's going on around us and the people around us and what's happening. And so we can do what we do well. And when that happens, then the needs of people are met. Mm -hmm. You might not be able to meet all of those people's needs, but all of us together can meet them. You know, they might need somebody to be compassionate and hug them a little bit. And Miss Jackie can just hug them and just make them feel so comfortable and all that. You may not, that might not be you. You might be the hammer. You might be looking for somebody to just tell them what to do and blast. And you say, man, you've got to quit that. That's so wicked and simple. You know, well, they don't need that, but they need somebody to hug them and say, baby, it's going to be all right. Well, here comes Miss Jackie. Boom. You know, there you go. And, and so it's not your job to do everything well. It's your job to do what God's gifted you and equipped you to do well and let everybody else do what they do well. And as a body, we'll minister to needs. Well, that's the power of purpose in calling us together. All right. Any, que any questions about that? Y'all, I'm just jabbering. I'm, okay. I don't want y'all to be sitting here not knowing what I'm talking about and then you won't say something about it. All right. Well, bodies are one accord. Right. Mm-hmm. I like that word, accord. 
one accord. <laughs> That's a good word. That is. That's a good word. Your helper's going to be back this weekend, by the way. The other bee. We got two killer bees here, and now we got our other one coming back this weekend. I like to look in the Bible, in the dictionary of what the word means. Yeah. And I like to think of the examples they give of Christian. It's Christ like. Right, Christ like. Yeah. You know, the word. Am I Christ like? Let me let me mention this to you. The word, the word, Christian, was first. The Bible tells us in the Book of Acts that believers mm-hmm. were called Christians first at Antioch, mm-hmm. a city of called Antioch in the Bible. This was a, a city full of obviously unbelievers. Uh, the, the gospel was just beginning to spread. So Antioch was a a town that uh, these these believers came into and started doing what they did to form a church and to reach people for Christ and all that. And it wasn't other believers that labeled them as Christians. It was the unbelieving world out there that said, somebody said, who are those people? And somebody in Antioch said, well, they're Christians. You know, Christian means, literally means little Christ. Mm -hmm. What are you? Now, see, they didn't call themselves that. The citizens, the unbelieving citizens of Antioch looked at them and said, well, how could we describe them? Well, gosh, the best way to describe them, they're like little Christ. They're Christians. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of take a little, I take a little notice of that, and I'm thinking to myself, whether we ought to be able to call ourselves a Christian if nobody else does. In other words, somebody else ought to call me a Christian before I have the right to call myself one. Mm-hmm. Somebody else has to see Jesus in me before I can start claiming I belong to him, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that's the word Christian, like Billy said. You know, it means he, to him when he sees it, it's Christ-like. Well, lit- literally, it means little Christ. So when you call yourself a Christian, you're saying, I'm a little Christ. So, anyway, that's just a word for you. Uh, don't know if that matters to you, but anyway. Law number three, the law of failure. Law of failure says no matter how good you are, sometimes you're going to fail. Sometimes things aren't going to work out like you think they are. And you're going to be discouraged, and you're going to be down, and you're going to feel like quitting. And don't tell me that you haven't felt that way before. Because I will tell you I have. I have. I have. And you know, you know, you look at me and say, "Well, you're our leader, and you're, you know, you're spiritual. We've been with the Lord all these years. Surely you, yeah, uh huh, that's right. I'm human too. And because I am, because I am, I, I do same stuff you do. I mean, you know, the enemy attacks me just like he attacks you, and I have the same thoughts every once in a while. Man, this ain't worth. What in the world, you know? I mean, you just you just get down sometimes. Well, the law of failure." Says now I'm going to read this. This is it's in your this is in your scripture notes. It's in Ecclesiastes four. It's in your notes. This is just this is just some verses out of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, and let me read you what he says here. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. In other words, two people when they work together can do far more than one which we know that's true, whether you're talking about digging a hole or writing a manuscript. I mean, two people can do more work than one by themselves. All right, let me go on. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's just saying, look, we need help. And when I can stand back to back with my friend and fight an enemy, then I'm going to do far better withstanding. And if we got another one, if there's three of us there, we really got a chance. And we need each other this way. And God puts us together so that we can have someone when times get bad. 
If you fall down and I'm walking with you, I'm going to pick you up. If I fall down, you're going to pick me up. It's a sad thing to fall down and, you, and no, there's no one there to help you up. Nobody to pick you up. Nobody got you back. Nobody encourages you to say, come on, man. Look, I know it's bad. We can make it. We, we can, we've been in rough times. We've been in worse places than this. Come on, let's go. You know, chin up. Come, it, we, we got it. We got it. I'm, I'm going to help. You know, we, and, and it's just an encouragement for you to be there. And one of the reasons why the Lord gives you a mate is so that there will be somebody there to pick you up when you get messed up. To, I can't tell you how many times Tanya's encouraged me. I don't know that I've ever had to encourage her, but she's had to encourage oh, me yeah. quite a bit. <laughs> quite a bit. A whole you know. bunch of times you've had to encourage me. Yeah. Well, we won't talk about all that. You're but. the encourager. <laughs> but anyway, that's why God gives you a mate. So that's really just very simple. I don't, I don't think I really need to um, carry that on, do I? Do I need to say anything else about that? Y'all got that. That's pretty straightforward, right? All right, let's go to the fourth law, moving right along. Hey, yeah. The fourth law is the law of hospitality. And the law of hospitality just simply means that God, to be hospitable means that, that we're going to uh, bestow good on strangers or guests. Uh, we're going to give generous treatment, uh, as a good way to put it. To, we're going to give generous treatment to guests or to strangers. We're going to be hospitable. Well, together, God has, uh, has given us an opportunity to be hospitable to people because I don't know about you, but by yourself, you might not notice certain things. Or you might be a little skittish about certain things to be kind or gracious to someone mm -hmm. because you don't want to put, you, you feel uncomfortable maybe putting yourself out there. But when you have a mate, all of a sudden, now it's like, hey, you want to go out, you want to go, let's go out to eat. Go, come on with me and my husband or me and my wife. Come on, let's go out. Well, that's the gift, that's a gift of hospitality. And when we're together, God gives us a greater vantage of that. Uh, in the Bible, as an example, the, we talked about it a minute ago, uh, about, about Elisha. And you know, Elijah in, in 2 Kings, he goes, by, he goes to this same city and, and ministers as a prophet of God in this city. Well, he comes there quite regularly. Well, there, there's a woman, an older woman, who's, who they're well off. She's called a noble, a noble woman, which just means that they have some money and they have some, some goods. And she and her husband, and they have a nice home, and they notice this, and they come to the meetings. And so God puts in her heart, and, 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 and she says uh, to her husband, she says, you know what I've been thinking? I've been thinking that Elisha, you know, he travels all over the place, and he... he has to stay wherever and he never knows where he's going to stay and what's going to happen and that that has to get old you know it has to get old so what i was thinking I, I believe the lord put it in my heart i believe god spoke to me about this that we ought to build him a little room and at our house and when he comes into town we ought to get, let him stay in this room and this is kind of like his special room and he can have a little desk there and a chair and, and we can put a little lamp oil and he can, and it'll just be his. And that way he doesn't have to worry about where he's going to stay. He just, he just comes in and does what God tells him to. And then, and then he comes here to this room and he just can stay as long as he wants to. And whenever God calls him somewhere else, he can go and just, he can just kind of go in and out of this. And then the husband says, okay, that's good. And then the husband builds the room. So she has the vision for the room, and he builds the room. So what I'm, what I'm showing you is that in the couple, God has given both of them responsibility for, for being hospitable to someone. She sees it, and then he follows it up. So the point is that either one of them by themselves, 
Elisha would have been sleeping in the barn, maybe. He would have never had the little room. And what did God do uh, because of their hospitality? He blessed them because she was old, and, and he was old, and they couldn't have a child. And then Elisha called them up to the room they built for him and said, this time next year, uh, you're going to have a child. And what did she say to him? Oh, man of God, don't tell me. Don't tell me that. In other words, I just put that dream to bed. Don't wake it up. I just finally concluded God wasn't going to give me a child, and I've just come to an emotional conclusion that it ain't going to happen, and so don't, don't, don't get me all fired up about that again. He said, no. He said, it's going to happen. And sure enough, it did happen. And uh, it's a great story. Uh, I preach a message on it called Never Give Up. And uh, anyway, but that the point, the point is here is the law of hospitality. Now, see, I mean, I know every one of you guys. I know Mitch and Sharon, if, uh, if George and Alabama are playing in the championship of the SEC, they're going to, they're going to, we're going to go over to their house and eat all their food up and everything. <laughs> watch their TV. And we're going to watch Alabama beat them. I'm not, no, I'm kidding. I, 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 I. We, we, if, if Alabama's the home team, they come into our house. If Georgia's the home team, we go into their house. So I don't know who's going to be home, who's going to be visitor, but they'll probably be the two playing in the SEC championship. But I'm just saying that together, you know, you can be hospitable. And, it, and, it, and God gave you a mate. See, this is why I'm saying you can't be unequally yoked. You can't have like a Tide fan and a, and a Georgia fan in the same house. You got to be both, you know, one accord. I, I joke about that. But, but that's, I mean, you can have that, I guess. But, uh, yeah, this is called divided. Yeah, that's the house divided. Yeah, I, we don't want any divided houses. You watch these 30 for 30s and you watch these Alabama people and the Auburn people that are married to each other. I'm thinking that marriage ain't going to last. <laughs> I'm thinking that man. They, you hear them, boy. They they just get all hostile about that stuff. I'm thinking, what silly people, you know. But anyway, get get serious about get mad about something serious, you know. I mean, you know, like somebody's lost and dying and going to hell. You, I mean, you're so, we got a whole world out here lost and dying and going to hell, and you worry about somebody winning a football game. I mean, come on. I mean, get serious. It's fun and it's entertaining and it's part of life that I enjoy and you, you know we enjoy. And I'm not saying, you know, it's, it's evil to like football or. Sports or whatever, obviously, I, I enjoy it. It's good entertainment. It's good diversion. It's good, you know, to have a little passion about something like that. That's all right. But don't forget what the main thing is. The main thing is that the Lord's given us a purpose, and we got a whole world out here. That's right. We got a whole world out here dying and going to hell. And our job is to do everything we possibly can to change that and to give people perspective. And this gift of hospitality is one of those things. I know. Uh, I know uh, some of the most hospitable people we have, one of the couples, if I call their name, I won't, I won't y'all know them, but they're probably watching right now. I, I don't know if they're watching tonight, but they, they probably are. And uh, they're out of town for Thanksgiving and, and their family. And um, man, they are so hospitable. It, it's unbelievable, you know? They just, they just, they liable to just say to somebody sitting right in front of them, hey, let's go out to eat. They don't even know them from Adam's house cat. And, and next thing you know, they're best friends, you know, and because they just have such a gift of hospitality. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's the ministry together. I mean, that's, that's, that's good. That's what, it, that's what it's called about. All right. Uh, anything about that? Moving right along? All right, man, we are all ready to number five, and it's only, you know, seven o'clock. We're going. Number five, I think I'm going to make it. Everybody say, I think he's going to make it. You know what I mean? All right. All right. He's <laughs> praying for me. All right. Number five, the law of order. The law of order. The law of order is that God has an order in this world, an order for um, the way he has designed relationships to function. And the order is, and, and, and he says, and, and, the passage that you have, let me turn over to the note page that in your manual. Yeah, the, the you've got 1 Corinthians 11.3. You know what 1 Corinthians 11.3 says? Let everything be done decently and in order. Mm -hmm. So God says, all right, the way I operate is I operate in, in, order, in an ordered pattern. And here's the pattern. 
And he says the pattern is that Christ is the head of the man and the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. And this is how it happens. Directions and so forth come from the top down. It comes from God through Christ through us to you. And our responsibility is to be led by Christ. We're going to stand accountable before Christ one day. In other words, if I say to, to Pastor Tanya, I believe God wants us to do this, and she says, all right, if the Lord's spoken to you about it, then I'm with you. That's what we'll do. Even if it's wrong, even if it's not the right direction, it's not, it, it's not her responsibility for that. It's my responsibility. God's going to hold me accountable for that. And this is just, I mean, seriously, this right here is where lots of relationships get messed up. They get out of order. They get, they get you know, the, the kids. As a matter of fact, let me, let, me, let me read this. All right, this is in your notes. We wrote it right in here in page 95 in the middle of the page. It says to this, to everything in life there is order. There is an order that makes it a success or a failure. Do you see where I'm reading from in your notes? Mm -hmm. Page 95, right in the middle. Marriages fail when God's order of authority is disregarded. In like manner, businesses are crippled. When the, now, see, we're, talk, we're not, that, that's, this is about businesses. This is not just about Christianity. Let me, give you, let me give you this little clue or this little insight. When something is a principle, when I, if I say to you, this is a principle, what that means is no matter what situation you put it in, it's going to always be true. If you put it in marriage, it's true about marriage. If you put it in business, it's true about business. If you put it in money, it's true about money. Whatever you put it in, if it's the principle, it's going to work the same way. And when I say to you that order is a principle of God, whether you're talking about a school classroom, a business, your bank book, your marriage, your, your, your child rearing, whatever you put it in, it's, it, it's going to work the same. So listen to what it says. When, in like manner, businesses are crippled when the employees attempt to control the employer. Church fellowship unravels when individuals within the body attempt to overthrow the authority of its pastors and pastor and leadership. There is chaos in the home where parents have relinquished control, allowing a strong-willed two-year-old or a rebellious teen to rule the roost. As head of his home, the husband is expected to be the protector, the provider, and the priest of his home. This includes physical, emotional, and spiritual responsibilities. With such responsibility resting on his shoulders, no man can afford to be passive or lazy in his relationship with God. The only way a man can walk fully and effectively in his position of authority in his home is to walk completely under the leadership of his authority, God. If your family's out of order, your ministry will be as well. Mm -hmm. So what I've noticed happens is if, if a man does not lead his home, his wife will try to lead it, mm -hmm. which turns the authority upside down. No way it's going to be successful. If the, if the wife doesn't try to lead it, if he's got a son, the oldest son in the family will try to lead the family. As a matter of fact, there have been many cases where uh, an older son sub subverted the family because dad was so passive and lazy that he did nothing. As a matter of fact, you might find this interesting. Uh, in the Bible, uh, King David. Did you know that King David... Uh, historically, according to most biblical historians, had about 51 kids. Do you know this? Had about 51 kids. Yeah, he was, a, he was a terrible dad. King David was a terrible dad. He was not only not a good neighbor, uh, as evidence of Bathsheba and the, and the, and the sunbathing incident, uh, where he, you know, he seduced her as the king, used his power as the king to seduce her, and then she got pregnant, and then he tried to cover it up by calling her husband in from the battlefield, and the husband said, hey, look, 
Thank you, David, and I appreciate the effort, but the, root, the law of the land says I can't come in and enjoy my wife while these other guys are out there fighting a the battle, so I'm not going to do it. So that messed that little subversion up. And then he, had the, then he had the husband put out in the middle of the battlefield and all the troops withdraw and let the enemy kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's David. David. That's the one y'all love so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, pretty tough. When, but one thing about the Bible, it tells the truth about all of its heroes, mm -hmm. no matter how bad it might seem. But here's another truth about David. David uh, had a son by the name of Absalom. Absalom. And Absalom was, was, was one of the oldest mm -hmm. children. He was his son. And he had another son by the name of Amnon. Mm -hmm. He had a daughter by the name of Tamar. Well, Amnon rapes his own sister, Tamar. Mm -hmm. David hears about it. Absalom hears about it. And David does nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So Absalom takes matters into his own hands. Mm -hmm. In other words, dad's not going to do something about this. I'm going to have to do something about it. And Absalom kills Amnon for raping his sister. And then you know what Absalom did? Mm -hmm. He's he tried to take the kingdom away from his dad. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know what happened. He was riding along on a donkey. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it, was a, it was a whole big battle, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you, you know, just like months and months and months worth of battle. And David, here's what David said. David told his soldiers, he said, uh, you know, you can do anything, just don't, just don't, just don't, hurt, don't hurt Absalom. David is so dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. David is such an enabler. You know, he's just a weak, weak dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he's got a son trying to take his kingdom away from him. And his instruction is, well, don't, don't, don't you know, it's all right to fight against him, but don't hurt my boy. You, I mean, you the problem. You are the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, General, I think, I can't remember if his name, I think it was Nathan, if I'm not mistaken. I hadn't read the story in a while, but. I think it was Nathan, his general, uh, told the troops. Huh? Starts with a J. Anyway, whatever. His general, we'll just call him his general. I, I, Nathan was the pro. Nathan came in and made another statement to David at another time. Anyway, you guys on the internet, quit hollering the name. I can't hear it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he uh, he comes in and. And, and, and Absalom was riding on the back of a donkey, and Absalom had real long hair. And he was riding on the back of a donkey, and he rides under a limb, and his hair gets caught in the limb and jerks him off the back of the donkey, and he's hanging there, you know, bobbing in the limbs like this. And the general comes up, and the troops, you know, with the general, and, and the general says, you know, let him have it, and, they, and they, he's a pincushion. I mean, they just mutilate him. They kill him dead in a hammer. Because they're trying he's trying to take their kingdom away. He's the enemy. And so then they come in to see David and David said and he says, I got some good news for you and some bad news. And he said, Well, you know, what's the good news? And he said, Well you don't have to worry about your kingdom being taken away from you anymore. Yeah. And he said, Well what's the bad news? He said, We killed Absalom. And David fell out like a like a little old wimp. David fell out in the floor and started crying. And said, oh, Absalom, Absalom, how often? This is one of those famous soliloquies, you know, that happened in places. How often would I have gathered you like a mother hen does her chicks under her wings, but you would not? I mean, he's just crying. And you know what the general looks at him and says? Get up off that floor. You better dry those eyes up and get out here and quit crying and acting like a sissy, you know, I started to say a woman, but that'd be... I mean, that's, that's totally politically incorrect, incorrect. so I, I know it, I'm, you know, but I'm old, remember that. But anyway, but, but he, he gets him and he says, and here's what he says to him, and now see if, I mean, listen, the general says, you better get up and quit, you know, quit crying and, and acting like somebody that is ridiculous and foolish and idiotic. These men out here have given their lives to you. These men out here have fought battles for you. These men are men that have protected your kingdom and protected your honor and love you. And they're seeing you cry over the enemy 
And so you're saying to them that you love the enemy and you hate what they did. You better get up and act like a man and smile and tell these people you love them and appreciate what they did for you. And kicked him into behind, and, and David got up and did what the general said. That's David. That's your hero. I mean, these are just little known facts, but just the fact. But the, my point is that because of David not being a man, and, 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 and the order of God coming from the top to the bottom. When, when they anointed the high priest, in, in the Old Testament days, they had a, a high priest, like Aaron was the high priest. And when he got anointed, they would, anoint, they would take a, 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 like a, a, a cruise, a vessel of oil. Not just like, I mean, we got these little small bottles and we put a little on our finger and put it on your head or put it on your hand. That's what we call anointing. Now, what they did is they took like a vessel and they cracked that thing open and took it and poured it on your head and the oil ran down all down your head and all down your face and ran down on your garments and ran down all the way down. And then these little these little frills that were on the bottom of the high priest robe, the oil would drip off of those little things and the little, and the little subjugate priest would be down there underneath it like that, getting it out and, and putting it on himself like that, trying to get the drippings of the anointing that came off the high priest. But the point is that it was poured on his head and ran down. Order comes from the top to the bottom. And the same way in the, in the home. And so, dads, you can't be complacent and weak and, and not take your position uh, uh, seriously because you, if you don't be the dad, then you're going you're gonna to circumvent the function of your family. And I'm going to tell you, when your wife tries to run the house, it's going to turn the whole thing upside down, and she will if you don't. If you don't, look, if you don't take the authority that God has told you to take, somebody else is going to try to take it. It's either going to be one of your children or your wife, but, but it's going to mess you up. It's going to mess your home up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mess the, the, the order of God. Let everything be done decently and in order, which means you take your position and you take it seriously and you do it. All right? Is that pretty well? Did I, did I get way too far out of line? Okay. All right, just trying to let you know what's happening. Law number six. Law number six is the law of balance. Mm -hmm. The law of balance just simply says, if you had all the emotional qualities you needed, then God would not have given you a partner. And God has given you a partner to bring balance into your life. This is um, a psychological thought. Uh, this is a... a uh, surveyed of perceived needs kind of thought, but, but there have been studies into this with psychology and sociology and so forth nowadays, and you can Google it. Um, women are born with um, a tinge of, of fear. It, 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 women are born with a need for security. That, I mean, that's just, that's just a need that you have is to be secure. So you always have just a little bit of fear in you. Men are born with a sense of anger. Um, we, 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 all, we, we men have just a tinge you know, of, of aggression in us. So what God has done is he has put us with a mate so that we can balance each other out. So that ladies, because you have generally more of a sense of compassion, you move the family a little, to be a little bit more compassionate. Guys, you have a sense of, of the letter of the law, the hammer, you know, do it, this is the way it is. So you have a tendency to have that sense of confidence and, and you have a tendency to be a little harder. So in order that the family would not be totally hard and not compassionate at all, God brings you together and lets you balance out each other's tendencies. And because 
we, we don't need to be totally compassionate without this sense of responsibility and what's right and wrong and what to do about it. God gives you a mate and, and puts you together so that uh, you balance out his tendency to be too harsh with your sense of compassion, his sense of law with your sense of mercy or grace. And, and, and together, you know, God puts us together and, 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 and we're balanced. So here's what I'm saying. Guys, when you're sitting there, have you ever been tapped out? Have any of you ever been tapped out? You know what I'm saying when you're tapped out? Like you're sitting there and you start going on something and then all of a sudden you feel taps on you like that. Tap, they start tapping you on the side of the leg or something or reach down and they tap your foot a little bit. And that's, called, that's what I call tapped out. Yeah, <laughs> tap you on the arm like that. What that. And what they're saying is, all right, baby, settle down. Settle down. It's not from the Lord. You're getting a little too harsh now. You know, back up just a little bit. Just settle down. <laughs> when, what this law says is when, you, when she starts tapping you out, quit. Listen. That's why God put her there, to balance you. Baby, I know, oh, I know you, this is in your wheelhouse, and I know you have strong passion about this, but this is, you're going a little bit too far. You're going a little bit too fast. Let me back off of this just a little bit, baby. That's what that tap means. And then, ladies, when, when, when you get the tap, <laughs> when you get the tap, that tap is saying to you, look, don't be afraid. This is okay. I got it. Don't worry. We're going to make it. This is not in it. Just settle down. Everything's going to be all right. You listen to that, and you just settle yourself on down. Then God gives us each other to do that, to balance us out so that we don't get whacked out and lose our testimony and lose our opportunity to witness to people and to not realize. I mean, you know, you know what the hardest thing to do is? To, to see yourself while you're in the process of something. Like when I get mad, when I get mad, I don't really see myself the way I I'm, I'm really am. I'm seeing myself, you know, I mean, my passion or my anger or my sense of justice or whatever you want to call it is, is, is clouded my vision so that I don't realize how loud I'm talking. I don't realize how aggressive I look. I don't realize how, how angry I sound. I, I think I'm okay. But somebody observing that who loves me and who God's put in my life for such a time as this can tap on me and say, it's all right, babe, settle down. Settle down. Then you need to listen to that. You don't need to just blow through that and say, you, hey, leave me alone. No, you settle down. That's why God gave them to you. And that's a blessing to you. Listen to that. Same way, ladies, when you get insecure and you feel like, oh, no, the world's coming to an end and this is horrible. I don't know what. I'm... That little tap means don't worry. We're going to make it through this. God's got us. Just settle down. Settle down. Dial back your anxiety. Dial it back on in. It's going to be all right. And then you just settle down. You listen. You listen to what they say. What, Lauren? Last time we had one of my wife and almost numbed it down the old complex. We were living with our dog. Our dog come up this mm -mm. We had everybody. We called, the whole complex was looking for our dog. Our dog was sitting in our back bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> out, the dog was sitting back there going, what's up? What's up? Yeah. Mega yeah. sitting there going, what? What? Yeah. What's up? Yeah. What? What's all this excitement around here? Man, where are you? The dog's kind of following around, going, "Where y'all going? What's?" Right. So what I'm saying is, when at that point. Tap, tap, tap means, okay, it's good. And I'm just saying to you, listen to that. That is God talking to you. That's God talking to you. That's right. And I'm just saying to you, listen to that and do that. Settle down. That's why, I mean, they're not trying to hurt you. They are there to help you. 
And that's what they're trying to do. So dial yourself back in, reel yourself back in, and realize that if, if you will listen to them, things are going to be better than if you keep on going in the direction you're going in. Because remember, we are to reflect Christ. Remember, that's our purpose. Our purpose is to not get out of whack and not get up on our high horse and not to get all out of whack. We are subject to Christ. Men, we are subject to Christ. Women, you are subject to, the, to your husband. <laughs> I didn't say it. God did. I didn't write that. God did. So when he taps you, you listen. When, when your wife, as an object of the Lord, taps you, you listen to what they're saying. That's our responsibility, and that's why God puts you together. And if you didn't need that, you wouldn't need a mate. If you had all that without it, then you wouldn't need anybody else. But because you don't, you need somebody, God puts somebody in your life to make sure that happens to you. All right, that's one of the laws of this ministry of, of couples. All right, number, number seven, the law of priesthood. The law of priesthood just simply says, I'm responsible for my whole family. The law of priesthood says, I'm, I don't just worry about me and my wife. I worry about our kids. I want to make sure everybody in my family knows the Lord. I want to make sure my children are saved and going to heaven when they die. I, you know, I know we all have a tendency to want to preach to them, preach, preach, preach. We want to hammer them. We want to intimidate them. We want to conjole them. We want to whatever we want to do to make sure they come to the Lord. But it's not our, look, you, whatever it takes is what I'm saying to you. You are the priest, and it means that you're, you care. You, you don't just let it go by the wayside. Now, I know you can't save anybody, and I know that if they're not interested, you can't make them interested. But get in the prayer of agreement with your mate. Pray for their souls. Pray for their conviction. Pray for God to open a door for you. Uh, who knows, like, like the Bible says, that you wives uh, Pray that God would let you shine so that even without a word, your, 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 your man might be drawn to the Lord because he sees the way the Lord's affect your life. And he says, what in the world, boy? It has to be something powerful to have her like that. What is it, you know? I mean, so that they, without a word, <laughs> might, might become the Lord, you know? You might, preaching might not be the way they need it, you know, uh, uh, seeing you, uh, uh, feeling you, uh, tragic something, uh, uh, something dramatic. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, there's something that needs to happen for them to be attracted to the Lord. So what is it? And when it happens, notice it and jump in it, you know, and whatever it is. I mean, that's your responsibility. Uh, the Lord's in the business of, of saving entire families. The Lord is not just interested in you being saved. He's interested in your wife being saved, your children being saved, everybody in the family being saved. And if you look in the Bible, there are multiple examples of a person coming to the Lord and then their entire family coming to the Lord. Like the Philippian jailers are the perfect example. You know, the jail, yeah. Paul and Silas are in the jail and at midnight they're singing praises to the Lord and the Lord sends an earthquake angel and he shakes the whole thing and everything falls apart and all the prisoners escape except Paul and Silas and, and, then, and then the guard comes and he sees all the cells broken down and everything, and, he, and, he, and he's about to kill himself, and Paul says, hey, wait a minute, don't do yourself any harm, we're all here. Mm -hmm. And then the jailer falls on the ground and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And he does, and then the jailer takes Paul and Silas home to his family, and then all his family gets saved, comes to the Lord. That's God's plan. God's plan is not just that you would come, but everybody in your whole house would come. You are the priest, which just means you're the head, but everybody else is going to come too. So you be interested in everybody else coming. Don't just think about yourself. God wants to move in your entire family. All right, let's go on. Uh, We've got two minutes, five minutes to do all the rest of this. Law number eight, the law of inheritance. The law of inheritance just basically says that you're your seeds are going to inherit from you your standing in the kingdom. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not meaning they're going to be saved because you're saved, because God has no spiritual grandchildren. He only has children. 
you know, they're not going to be saved because you're saved because they're your grand. No, 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 no. God only has sons and daughters, no grandchildren. But, I, but what I am saying is that if, they, if, they're, if they're saved, if they're Christians, like, like as an example, my children, all right, my children are going to inherit from me a certain pattern of relationship, a certain standard of communication with God and, and ease with God and knowledge of God and his purpose and, 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 and a functionality, a functionality with God. If you look at my children now and you see what they do, it's because they have been reared in that environment and they have learned that ease of relationship with God and that sense of call and purpose because they've lived in a family that has demonstrated that and they inherit from us that kind of thing. And then they're going to pass it to their children so their children will inherit from them a certain sense of, of operation with God and knowledge of God and ease with God and understanding of God because of of the generations that come and every generation intensifies. I mean, it's like, like you look in the Bible, you have Abraham and Sarah as an example. All right. You remember Abraham and Sarah, they're old. They don't have a baby. God says to Sarah, you're going to have a baby. And she laughs. And so they named the little baby laughter. They named him Isaac, which means laughter. So they have Isaac. So Abraham and Sarah have one child. and His name is Isaac. Isaac has two children. One's named Jacob, one's named Esau. Jacob has 12 children that become the 12 tribes of Israel. And now there are more Jewish people scattered all over the world than sands of the sea and stars of the sky because out of one, two, 12 zillions. See, every generation intensifies as it passes down an inheritance. Abraham passed down an inheritance to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to, to his sons, and then his sons to now a whole kingdom. And, and so the point is that your children are going to inherit from you a certain ease of relationship with God, a certain pattern of operating with God, a certain style of understanding of God. And, and so it's important what you show them and what you pass out. Here's what, here's what I want. Now, when we started Freedom River Church, we started it because we, we sensed that God spoke to us about this. Now, he had to, you know, you know kick us screaming. We had, he had to drag us kicking and screaming out of where we were in order to do it. But he finally got to the point where I, I think his patience just ran out on us. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he said, all right, if you're not going to do this, then I'm going to have to do it. And he drug us up out of there, you know, kicking and screaming. Well, but once he got his message across to us, then we hooked on to it, hook, line, and sinker. Then it was like, all right, we got you. You know, we won't, won't make, ever make that mistake again. I hear you, and, yeah, that's right. I hear you, Dad. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, Father. And, uh, and he drug all of us, kicking and screaming up. But, but anyway, um, because of that, m my children have inherited something that they didn't have before. Well, now, my grandchildren are being reared in the environment that they don't even know what it was like back then. They don't even have, they don't have an idea what old traditional church is like. They don't know what a committee is. They don't know what deacons are. They don't know. I mean, we have deacons in our church. I don't know if y'all know that. They're just not elected. Mm -hmm. A deacon means servant. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. So when I come to you... And I would say, Ron, I'd like, w would you go over and help so-and-so do so-and-so? All right, he's a deacon. Mm -hmm. He just became a deacon right there because he's gone to do the job of helping someone, so he's a deacon. Same way, I say, Pat, would you please help us and do this? All right, Pat becomes a deacon. Mm -hmm. So when they get through with that job, then they're not a deacon anymore. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But they are one while they're doing the job. They're not elected by the church to make sure the pastor doesn't ruin everything. That's what most deacons think they are, is they think they're some kind of council to protect the church from the pastor. It's ridiculous. It's, it's just a perversion of, of God's understanding. Mm -hmm. but, but so my point is, is be, because, because of the response of, responsiveness 
of you, your children are going to inherit something from you. And their children are going to inherit something from them. And what I, as, a, as kind of the head right now, uh, want is I don't want my children to have to fight any battles that I should have fought. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't want to run from any enemies or not do what God's leading me to do to leave to them to do what I should have done. I mean, I don't want to leave a Goliath out here that I should have took care of while I was in charge. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to be delayed and have to fight around something that if I'd have took care of it 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But because I was too lazy or too cowardice or too sorry to pay attention, I left an enemy hanging around that should have been taken care of. And now my children got to fight enemies that I was supposed to conquer. No, 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 no. I'm looking for all of them that I'm supposed to get. And then they'll have their own enemies. They'll have their own obstacles. They'll have stuff they have to fight. But that's fine. They just don't need to be fighting any of mine. Mm -hmm. So the law of inheritance says know that and pay attention to that because they will inherit both good and bad from you. So limit your bad, enhance your good, realize that. Number nine, the law of peace. The law of peace just basically said God wants us to live in peace, that we're to seek for peace that our relationships are intended to be peaceful, that we're responsible to bring peace, we're responsible to live at peace. So uh, if you're having fights and fusses all the time in your family, get over it, get, get somewhere, get some counseling, learn how to act, uh, pray and ask God to ease your spirit, ease your conscience, uh, whatever it is that's causing you to be like you are, it ain't working, and if you're gonna have to get a divorce, get one. Uh, you know, I know that there's some situations that can't be rectified. I mean, there's some situations that are beyond redemption point. We have to just admit that. We have to know that. Uh, that's just the way it is. And if that's where you are, rather than the battle royal all in your family reared or the battle going on and fussing and fighting and the accusations and can't live together and blah, blah. I mean, you're killing the nature and heart of your family by living in this battlefield going on all the time and don't do that if you need to get out get out if you're if you if you're going to be damaged now listen this is one thing and, and this, there are a lot of people that think i'm married and i could never get out of this well the bible says there's only one reason why why you should divorce and that's for, because of adultery which jesus said that jesus said that that's your one one reason is that if there's adultery, then it's broken the covenant, and, and you, you're free under that. But there are some situations where you just can't live peacefully with somebody. They just won't let you. It's just the fact, and that's just all it is to it. And if you have to separate and, and all that, well, then you just have to do because you can't just keep living and battling all the time, and especially if somebody's threatening to hurt you. If somebody's threatening to hurt you, you better get out of there. Because you just one lick away from being out of here. And if, they, if they're hitting on you and beating on you or threatening you or whatever, just, you just bet your money. They're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time. And they hit you in the right place. The only reason you're alive right now is because you just bet, hadn't been hit in the right place. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're already, you know, abusing you and all that. Get out of there. Do not sit there and say, well, God doesn't want me to get in there. You better get out of there. You can, hey, I'm going to pray for him. Yeah, you better pray. Let him be in Hattiesburg. You be down here. You can pray for him right down here. You know, get on up out of there because it's dangerous for you. And don't think God's holding you responsible to stay there in that kind of mess. God wants us to have peace and to live at peace. And if counseling won't do it and, and, and whatever else might need to be in place won't do it then you know you have to separate yourself on out of there and just go on with life and say lord i'm moving on uh help me you know and go on because you know you just can't continually live in that kind of stirred up raucous type of environment and thrive and and it just that's just the way it is all right that one might somebody might argue about that but go ahead law 10 Law 10 is law of self-control. Law, the law of self-control says if you're not married, you are responsible to control yourself. 
You can't go jumping around, getting in bed with people and think that's okay with God, because it's not. I mean, we're all sexual creatures. God has created us to be sexual. Most of us can't control ourselves. That's why we've got a mate, because we can't control that area of our life. It's just a very powerful thing. It's too, it's too powerful. As a matter of fact, did you know that sexual fulfillment and, and uh, sexual involvement is the only thing in the Bible that says that you're not to stand and fight against. Every other thing, every other carnality, put on the whole armor of God, stand against it, battle against it, war against it. Sexual sin, you know what God says? Run. Run. What he says? He says, flee fornication. What he says, exactly what he says. One verse in Corinthians says two words, flee fornication which means if sex is too strong for you, you, you can't beat it. It's going to get you. So don't even tempt yourself thinking you're going to win. You are not going to win. You are going in there, and if you put yourself in a compromising position, you are going to have sex with somebody. I mean, look, when you walk into, you come in, you drive home with somebody, and, and you're dating them, and they say, would you like to come in? Uh, uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't. I mean, all right, you go in there. Don't tell me you don't know what's fixing to happen. You know what's fixing to happen. You know you're going to go in there and you're going to sit down on the couch and they're going to say, would you like something? You're going to get a little glass of wine and they're going to be smelling good and all that and you're going to be in this little comfortable environment and then all of a sudden one little thing's going to lead to another and to another and then you're going to start doing this and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, you're going to be feeling guilty because you had sex with somebody. Well, you knew that before you went in there. You know, you know what a good portion of deliverance is? Don't put yourself in that position. You already know what's going to happen. And I know somebody says, well, I need to see if I can be compatible. Pfft. Look, in that area you headed for, I'm going to tell you right now, you are compatible. God built you to be compatible. He built you to fit just right. And to meet that need, you don't need to see if you're compatible. You are. I can already tell you that. Because that's the way God created us. And he created us, look, the drive for sex is the most powerful drive in the world. It's more powerful than money. It's more powerful than success. People have given up kingdoms for sex. People have given up fortunes for sex. You cannot beat it. It's way too powerful. So the law of self-control means if God has not given you the gift of celibacy, then you need to have a mate. Because you can't just be going around hopping in the sack with people and expect to represent Christ. Because when people see your car at her house or your car at his house at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, and they drive by at 6 o'clock on the way to work and your car is still there, don't tell me that they don't know what you've been doing. And don't tell me that you're going to be able to talk to them at work about receiving Christ and it's going to have any input into their life. No, they're going to be thinking, uh-huh, if you're a Christian, why are you out there laid up with somebody you're not married to? You just ruined and spoiled your opportunity to say a word about Christ. So if you can't control yourself, pray that God will give you a mate. If you can control yourself, it means that probably God's given you the gift of celibacy, which means there are people on this earth that God has given them the ability to not be driven by sex. Now, it's not very many people. And the reason I say this is because the primary command that God gave to humanity right from the very start of humanity was be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, which means be fruitful, which means bear fruit. Not, it's not just another way of saying have babies. Bear fruit means you have a purpose. My fruit is the image of Christ. So I am to bear fruit and multiply. Now, there it multiplies when you're talking about babies. Mm -hmm. So my responsibility is to bear fruit, show Jesus on the earth, mm -hmm. fulfill your purpose, and have some babies, multiply, and keep this earth stocked with people. Mm -hmm. Now, the only way that's going to happen is a whole bunch of getting together going on. Because there are plagues, there are wars, there, there are famines, there's pestilences. I mean, whole nations die. Uh, droughts, floods, all that. 
And so there needs to be lots of people born to make sure that the people still on this earth. Well, in order for that to happen, that means about probably 99% of the people on the earth need to have babies. So God's going to put that drive in all of them to make sure that we get together so we can have babies. Now, about 1% of the people don't have to have that because that's just a little handful of people out of millions, you know. And so you might be one of those that you don't care about sex. I've met them. Have you ever met anybody like this? Have you ever have any, you have anybody in your family? I, I have somebody in my family. I have, I've had two or three people in my lineages of my family that were like this. They weren't homosexual. They weren't bisexual. They weren't sexual. I mean, they just didn't care about that at all and never did their whole life. We, we thought they were funny, you know. But that's because I didn't understand that God give some people that they just don't, they're not driven. They don't care about it. It's not that they want something different. They don't want anything out of it. And I don't understand that because I don't have that gift. <laughs> you know, I'll just be honest with you. I don't have that gift. But if you do, then that, that is a gift. Consider it a gift. Say, thank God I got a gift. That means I can serve the Lord and not have to be attached to anybody and not care about going home and making supper or getting supper or, or having a family or making sure I do this with the family. And I, I mean, I, I'm just completely free to just, I can be called to the mission field and, you know, somewhere on the backside of the world because I don't even have to check with anybody and say, hey, is this going to be all right? I just pop, pop everything down and say, the Lord called me there and boom, I'm gone. Nobody's affected by that but me. Nobody's, you know, nobody's worried about that but me because I'm just, I'm out here. I'm, a, I'm an independent contractor. I'm free. That's what, that's what the scripture teaches about that. So anyway, there you go. All right, is that too much? Is all that too heavy? All right, there are the 10 laws of ministry. That's why God put us together. So look at your mate and say, I love you. Thank you for being God's answer to my need. <laughs> I love you. You're God's answer to my need. And I pray that I'll be the answer to your need. So that's why God put us together. All right. Is that good? That's good. All right. So journey is officially dismissed in just a second until January. And we'll do, we have three other studies besides this one. Um, I'm not sure which ones, which ones, Start the first study, experiencing the seven principles of experiencing God. How many of you have been through that already? One, two, three, four. All right. How many of you have been through uh, the spiritual gifts so you can find out what gifts you have and how they work and how they function? Okay. Pretty much the same ones. All right. And, and how many of you have been through uh, uh, the teaching about God's purpose, how to know it, what he wants you to do, how to keep that alive, how to know what it is for the rest of your life, and how to function in that for the rest of your life. Have you done that one? All right, about the same. Okay, so do any of you have any preference as to what we do next? <clears throat> Say it out loud if you do. Spiritual gifts, seven principles to experience God. That seven principles of experiencing God is so dynamic. They're all, they all are to me. But it'll change your whole view of what being a Christian is all about and how to recognize God and to be excited about God and to know what God's saying to you. And, and uh, I mean, if you don't know, if you don't know those, if you don't understand that, it's hard to, I don't, it's hard to motivate yourself. You know, I mean, you need to be able to see God working in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's what those seven principles are about, is about how to see it and what it is. So anyway, you like that? What'd you say? You're up for it? You like that? All right, is anybody else up for that? All right, well we'll, we'll, well, we'll do it then. We'll do that. We'll do that. And then we'll do, I mean, we'll do all of them eventually. So uh, that, we'll do that. So all right, so in January, sometimes we'll start with those seven principles of experiencing God. And uh, if you guys can encourage others that may be new or maybe some people you hang with that you know hadn't been through some stuff, uh, come on, come on. It's like I was saying this morning in the message, you need to take advantage of every opportunity you can for the Word of God to be put into your life. Yeah. Because, look, the more you get it, the more dynamic your life becomes. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the better your relationship and the more mature, you, you, you're more peaceful. You're more, uh, you're ba your balance is better. Your, yeah. your, your, yeah. your strength is better. 
and, and you're not so vulnerable and up and down. And, you know, you, it, it helps you uh, to engraft. God engrafts the word in your life, which is able to rescue you, is literally what it says. All right. All right, let's join. Yes, give you another bullet, another, gun, another, another arrow in your quiver, another bullet in your gun. That's, That's right, right, Lord. That's right. All right. Father, thank you for your love for us. We pray your blessings as we go. May this be a great week. We do thank you. We love you. Lord, we pray for our congregation. We pray for those that we love. We pray that this would be a safe time, a great time, an opportunity to, to be uh, impressed by you, reflected by you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. All right. Bless the Lord. Yes. Wait a minute. Let Tanya turn us off.